Intelligent Design. Book One, the book which tells the truth. Chapter One, the encounter. Ever since I was nine years old, I had but one passion: motor racing. I founded a specialist motorsport magazine in 1970, simply to be able to live in the environment of a sport where man is constantly trying to surpass himself. While striving to surpass others, since my early childhood, I had dreamt of one day being a motor racing driver, following in the footsteps of someone as famous as Fangio. Thanks to contacts made through the magazine I founded, I was given the opportunity to race, and about ten trophies now adorn my apartment as a result of those races. On 13th of December 1973, however, I went to a volcano overlooking Clermont-Ferrand in central southern France. I went more to get a breath of fresh air than to take a drive in my car. My legs were itching after a full year following the races from circuit to circuit, almost always living on four wheels, so to speak. The air was cool at the time, and the sky rather grey with a background mist. I walked and jogged a little and left the path where my car was parked, aiming to reach the centre of the crater called Puy de la Solace, where I often went for picnics with my family in the summer. What a superb and breathtaking place it was! To think that thousands of years ago, right where my feet were standing, lava had spurted out at incredibly high temperatures. Decorative volcanic bombs can still be found among the debris. The stunted vegetation resembled that of Provence in France, but without the sunshine. I was just about to leave and looked for the last time towards the top of the circular mountain, which was formed by an accumulation of volcanic slag. It reminded me how many times I had slid down those steep slopes as if I was on skis. Suddenly, in the fog, I saw a red light flashing. Then a sort of helicopter was descending towards me. A helicopter, however, makes a noise, but at that moment I could hear absolutely nothing—not even the slightest whistle. A balloon, maybe. By now, the object was about twenty meters above the ground, and I could see it had a somewhat flattened shape. It was a flying saucer. I had always believed in their existence. But I had never dreamt I would actually see one. It measured some seven meters in diameter, about two point five meters in height, was flat underneath and cone-shaped. On its underside, a very bright red light flashed, while at the top, an intermittent white light reminded me of a camera flash cube. This white light was so intense that I could not look at it without blinking. The object continued to descend without the slightest noise until it stopped and hovered motionless about two meters above the ground. I was petrified and remained absolutely still. I was not afraid, but rather filled with joy to be living through such a great moment. I bitterly regretted not having brought my camera with me. Then the incredible happened: a trap door opened beneath the machine, and a kind of stairway unfolded to the ground. I realized that some living being was about to appear, and I wondered what it was going to look like. First, two feet appeared, then two legs. Which reassured me a little, since apparently I was about to meet a man. In the event, what at first I took to be a child came down the stairway and walked straight towards me. I could see then this was certainly no child, even though the figure was only about four feet, one point two meters tall. His eyes were slightly almond-shaped. His hair was black and long, and he had a small black beard. I still had not moved, and he stopped about ten meters away from me. He wore some sort of green one-piece suit, which covered his entire body, and although his head seemed to be exposed, I could see around it a strange sort of halo. It was not really a halo, but the air about his face shone slightly and shimmered. It looked like an invisible shield, like a bubble, so fine that you could barely see it. His skin was white with a slightly greenish tinge, a bit like someone with liver trouble. He smiled faintly, and I thought it best to return his smile. I felt rather ill at ease, so I smiled and bowed my head slightly in greeting. He answered with the same gesture. Thinking that I had to find out if he could hear me, I asked, "Where do you come from?" He answered in a strong, articulate voice that was slightly nasal, "From very far away." "Do you speak French?" I inquired. 
I speak all the languages of the earth. Do you come from another planet? Yes, he replied. As he spoke, he moved closer and stopped about two meters from me. Is this the first time you have visited the earth? Oh no. Have you been here often? Very often, to say the least. Why did you come here? Today. To talk to you. To me? Yes, to you. Claude Varian, editor of a small motorsport magazine, married and father of two children. How do you know all that? We've been watching you for a long time. Why me? This is precisely what I want to tell you. Why did you come here on this cold winter morning? I don't know. I felt like walking in the fresh air. Do you come here often? In the summer, yes. But almost never in this season. So, why did you come today? Had you planned this walk for a long time? No. I don't really know. When I woke up this morning, I suddenly had an urge to come here. You came because I wanted to see you. Do you believe in telepathy? Yes, of course. It's something I've always been interested in, as well as the subject of flying saucers, but I never thought I'd see one myself. Well, I used telepathy to get you to come here, because I have many things to tell you. Have you read the Bible? Yes, but why do you ask? Have you been reading it for a long time? No, as a matter of fact, I bought it only a few days ago. Why? I really don't know. Suddenly I had an urge to read it. Again, I used telepathy to make you decide to buy it. I have chosen you for a very difficult mission, and I have many things to tell you. So come into my craft where we can talk more comfortably. I followed him, climbing up the small staircase beneath the machine, which on closer inspection looked more like a flattened bell with a full and bulging underside. Inside it, two seats faced one another, and the temperature was mild even though the door was still open. There was no lamp, but natural light emanated from everywhere. There were no instruments like those you find in an aircraft cockpit. The floor was made of a sparkling alloy, which was slightly bluish. The chairs were colorless and translucent, but very comfortable, and made from one piece of material. I sat on the larger one that was set closer to the floor, so that the face of the little man sitting in front of me was at the same level as mine. He touched a spot on the wall, and the whole machine became transparent except for its top and bottom. It was like being in the open air, but the temperature was mild. He invited me to take off my coat, which I did, and then he started to speak. You regret not having brought your camera so that you could have talked about our meeting to the whole world with proof in your hands. Yes, of course. Listen to me carefully. You will tell human beings about this meeting, but you will tell them the truth about what they are and about what we are. Judging from their reactions... We will know if we can show ourselves freely and officially. Wait until you know everything before you start speaking publicly. Then you will be able to defend yourself properly against those people who will not believe you, and you will be able to bring them incontestable proof. You will write down everything I tell you and publish the writings in a book. But why did you choose me? For many reasons. First of all, we needed someone in a country where new ideas are welcomed and where it is possible to talk about such ideas openly. Democracy was born in France, and this country has a reputation the world over for being the country of freedom. Also, we needed someone who is intelligent and quite open to everything. Above all, we needed someone who is a free thinker without being anti-religious. Because you were born of a Jewish father and a Catholic mother, we consider you to be an ideal link between two very important peoples in the history of the world. Besides, your activities do not in any way predispose you to making incredible revelations, and this will make your words all the more believable. Since you are not a scientist, you will not complicate things and will explain them simply. Not being a literary man, you won't compose elaborate sentences, which are difficult to read for a great many people. Finally, we decided to choose someone who was born after the first atomic explosion in 1945, and you were born in 1946. We have in fact been following you since your birth, and even before. This is why we have chosen you. Do you have any other questions? Where do you come from? From a distant planet, about which I will tell you nothing for fear that men of the earth might be unwise enough to disturb our peace. Is your planet very far away? Very far. When I tell you the distance, you will understand that it is impossible to reach it with your present level of scientific and technical knowledge. What are you called? 
We are people like you, and we live on a planet similar to Earth. How long does it take you to come here? As long as it takes to think about it. Why do you come to Earth? To monitor and watch over the development of humanity. Human beings on Earth are the future. We are the past. Are there many people on your planet? There are more people than on yours. I would like to visit your planet, can I? No. First of all, you couldn't live there because the atmosphere is different from yours, and you have not been trained for such a journey. But why meet here? Because the crater of a volcano is an ideal place away from irksome people. I shall leave you now. Come back tomorrow at the same time with the Bible and something to take notes with. Do not bring any metallic objects and speak to no one of our conversation. Otherwise, we will never meet again. He handed me my coat, let me climb down the ladder and waved his hand. The ladder folded up and the door closed without a sound. Still without making the slightest murmur or any whistling sound, the craft rose gently to a height of about 400 meters, then disappeared into the mist. Chapter 2. The Truth. Genesis. The following day, I was at the meeting place again as arranged with a notebook, a pen and the Bible. The flying machine reappeared on time, and I found myself face to face once more with the little man, who invited me to enter the machine and sit in the same comfortable chair. I had spoken to nobody about all this, not even to my closest friends, and he was happy to learn that I'd been discreet. He suggested I take notes, and then he started to speak. A very long time ago on our distant planet, we had reached a level of technical and scientific knowledge comparable to that which you will soon reach. Our scientists had started to create primitive embryonic forms of life, namely living cells in test tubes. Everyone was thrilled by this. The scientists perfected their techniques and began creating bizarre little animals, but the government, under pressure from public opinion, ordered the scientists to stop their experiments for fear they would create monsters which would become dangerous to society. In fact, one of these animals had broken loose and killed several people. Since at that time, interplanetary and intergalactic explorations had also made progress, the scientists decided to set out for a distant planet where they could find most of the necessary conditions to pursue their experiments. They chose Earth, where you live. Now, I would like you to refer to the Bible, where you will find traces of the truth about your past. These traces, of course, have been somewhat distorted by successive transcribers who could not conceive of such high technology and could therefore only explain what was described as being a mystical and supernatural force. Only the parts of the Bible that I will translate are important. Other parts are merely poetic babblings of which I will say nothing. I'm sure you can appreciate that, thanks to the law which said that the Bible had always to be recopied without changing even the smallest detail. The deepest meaning has remained intact throughout the ages, even if the text has been larded with mystical and futile sentences. So, let us start with the first chapter of the book of Genesis. In the beginning, Elohim created the heaven and the earth. Genesis 1, verse 1. Elohim, translated without justification in some Bibles by the word God, means in Hebrew, those who came from the sky. And furthermore, the word is a plural. It means that the scientists from our world searched for a planet that was suitable to carry out their projects. They created, or in reality discovered, the Earth, and realized it contained all the necessary elements for the creation of artificial life, even if its atmosphere was not quite the same as our own. And the spirit of Elohim moved across the waters. Genesis 1, verse 2. This means the scientists made reconnaissance flights and what you might call artificial satellites were placed around the Earth to study its constitution and atmosphere. The Elohim saw that the light was good. Genesis 1, verse 4. To create life on Earth, it was important to know whether the sun was sending harmful rays to the Earth's surface, and this question was fully researched. It turned out that the sun was heating the Earth correctly without sending out harmful rays. In other words, the light was good. There was a night and there was a morning, the first day. Genesis 1, verse 5. This research took quite some time. The day mentioned here corresponds to the period in which your sun rises under the same sign on the day of the vernal equinox, in other words, about 2,000 years on Earth. 